Hello and welcome to another Cyclops Road. I am filled with love for my panelists and my panelists have filled my screen. <laughs> today's subject or today's uh, pitch is William S. Burroughs, Lord of the Rings. Let's go down our list of panelists. Anthony, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I've uh, been making podcasts that nobody listens to for about 10 years uh, and for my entire life. Uh, leading up to that time, I've been um, general geekery uh, and have been enjoying uh, all kinds of uh, mostly mainstream um, kind of comic books, movies, uh, music and all that stuff. Um, I've known uh, Tone for uh, a couple of years and I finally uh, have the pleasure of actually getting into one of these. I missed out uh, the last time I was invited. Uh, so I'm excited this... to see uh, what we get into. What do you th think the secret is of not drawing an audience for your podcast? Uh, being a nobody and um, being a hack, uh, not doing anything original. That's I, the secret. I am following uh, that pattern. <laughs> it's the internet, so no one can fire you. So <laughs> I can do podcasting for 10 years and be known to five people. <laughs> Napoleon. Hi. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and your creative endeavors. Okay. So um, I run a uh, podcast that some people listen to. Um uh, called The You Mind, uh, which ties into Creeping Wave Radio, which is an audio drama. It's a scripted audio drama that features some of the best local talent and local musicians. Um, and it's basically a storyline that's a combination of dreams I had, of um, a novel that I was writing that I queried and couldn't get any traction on. Uh, and it all kind of culminated into this uh, audio drama that is really what I focus on. Um, Anthony's been in it. Uh, he, he is the voice of Tybalt, the talking cat, who <laughs> wants to dominate the world. And uh, so we, we uh, do a lot of fun things with the U-Mind as it ties into the cre it, Creeping Wave, because U-Mind is kind of what happens when the mics are on on this podcast. And Creeping Wave is what happens when the mics turn off after tapping into interviews with spiritual creatures and cryptids and also regular people, because as I'm kind of learning, with podcasting, it's kind of like a Christmas pageant, a children's Christmas pageant. Basically, nobody shows up to the elementary school auditorium to hear five-year-olds sing Jingle Bells. But you show up to see your five-year-old mm -hmm. sing Jingle Bells. So you have to bring in guests that have people attached to them, that have a, already a following. And so when I'm trying to recruit voices, when I'm trying to recruit bands, when I'm trying to recruit people who come in it's like hey uh, a lot of people respond to this person a lot of people are really excited about what this person is doing and i want to be part of that and want to bring those people in and like uh just basically cross-pollination and so yeah. that's what i do we also do tiny little animations at the beginning of the episodes this season which it's killing me but <laughs> <laughs> i only work with photoshop and imovie i don't have like real animator software yet so uh. it's basically just me drawing real hard for a whole week <laughs> all right so. all right we'll get back to all those things later uh and as tell us a little bit about yourself um my name is as i publish comics as az terry i live in minnesota where it's very cold right now um and i don't do any of that podcast and stuff yet um i just kind of live in a whole and make comics and then emerge from that hole when the comics are done. So. <laughs> uh, and you finished I Don't Want to Be Famous recently, right? Yeah, um, I published it with Uncivilized Books, which is also where I work um, as the publishing assistant. Um, I'm working on another comic, but I Don't Want to Be Famous, like I was mentioning earlier, is sort of my uh, thesis for finishing my BFA. Hmm. And it's just a comic about someone who doesn't want to be famous. And that's, I don't know how, and someone else who does want to be famous. I should put it that way. Someone who wants, doesn't want to be famous and someone else who does, does that's want to be famous. I like juxtaposition. <laughs> <laughs> and then, hey, I'm Tone Malazzo. I'm the author of The Faith Machine. And I'm uh, still the author of Picking Up the Ghost, uh, available <laughs> wherever you buy books. Well, Pick Up the Ghost is now digital only, but Faith Machine is wherever you buy books. And uh, if you want to support us, I will put, 
I have links to everyone's sort of like core URL under their display name, but if you want to dive deeper, I will put links to other products. We uh, have people who have, are in multiple genres here and multiple products. I'll have them all in the doobly-doo after the sh uh, at the bottom of the show. Uh, we are going to be playing Microscope. It's a game by Ben Robbins. It is a game of world building, and I appreciate him creating it. I also appreciate Kai Sosnowski for creating Utgar's Chronicles, the webpage that we used to play this on. This website, uh, this uh, YouTube thing would not be possible without him. And so if we have decided beforehand, the topic is William S. Burroughs' Lord of the Rings. And we are going to go right into playing this. We're going to start by building out the palette. Uh, turn order, I'm going to use the order that people logged in here at the bottom. So let's start with Anthony. Add a palette item, um, yes or no. And everyone can, I, I don't think I mentioned this before, everyone has ability to edit and add things here. Um, could I get a little um, definition of uh, the, the palette itself? OK, so. Uh, palette items are things that you want to see or things you want to exclude. So, um, so the the concepts. Yeah, it's more like it's 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 not so granular necessarily as to being uh, adding events, but more mm -hmm. themes. So, if I was to do, if I was building a palette for Marvel in the early days, somebody would have added mutants. Somebody also would have added. Um, uh, shield. Uh, somebody would have uh, restricted uh, Kryptonians because you know, it. they don't own that. No Kryptonians. <laughs> not, not in the Marvel Universe, at least. Probably not in this one either. But uh, Well then, uh, since we're uh, mixing uh, some uh, William S. Burroughs and Lord of the Rings, um, uh, let's say a Rise of Dark Elves. Mm-hmm. From uh, from uh, the, uh, a mysterious um, underworld beneath the surface, um, okay. and uh, the um, uh, the appearance uh, of them becoming a menace to all the the top side folk. Okay, so go ahead and click add item, and then uh, that'll be a yes, which you might think is pre selected. Yep. Perfect, there you go. All right, Napoleon, what do you want to add or exclude? I would like to uh, add a caveat, uh, an if this, then, then, mm -hmm. uh, that if if the eagles are summoned, <laughs> they will demand sexual favor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, maybe uh, sexually demanding eagles, that's not really demanding. <laughs> It's just I mean, a price. Giant eagle? The Sex price for eagles. eagles. Yes. <laughs> it's the oldest profession, and the eagles were there. That's right. <laughs> so, actually, I should have made this disclaimer before. So, uh, we're all comfortable with the William Burroughs canon of drugs and sex and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, there's this movement in role playing to kind of have a uh, this. I should have done this before. It's so like be sure everyone's cool with everything we're doing. Um, I also want to say uh, part of for the prep I I did for this. I I saw a William Burroughs documentary on Amazon and uh, terrible person, like like most people in literature. Oh yeah. <laughs> truly. Oh yeah. Uh, uniquely terrible Horrendous. because he had some sort of like um, unique mental disorder that still has not mm -hmm. been analyzed. But you know. Shot his wife, sure, it was an accident, but then did it right in front of his four-year-old son and then abandoned him. And no <laughs> jail time. Yeah. Mm -mm. yeah. <laughs> Shared a 15-year-old boyfriend with Ginsburg. So, yeah, a lot, I mean, we can go on, but, yeah, we'll, we'll say terrible person. Uh, but I also sort of believe, like, uh, when the author's dead and they're not financially being supported by what we do, it's not as much of an issue. Uh, all right, um, Napoleon, did you add your eagles? Okay, uh, you may have to walk me through this. So okay. uh, I click on the focus. Uh, no, uh, palette. Palette, click on and the then, palette. Uh, to the right of palette, you see add item. Just click on that first. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. <laughs> Eagles demand sex. All yes. right. 
<laughs> Should have been an exclamation point, I think. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's inferred. <laughs> All right, I'm going to add. Uh, one of the the downsides of this game, or at least like portraying this game uh, and being the one recording it is everyone gets to see what a terrible speller I am. Oh. <laughs> uh, I am adding living alien typewriters. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Az, what you got? Um, okay, so this was the one I came up with on the top of my head uh, just before this. So hopefully this works. Um, mm -hmm. Ian Holm portrays someone both in the Naked Lunch movie and Bilbo Baggins, of course. Mm -hmm. I posit that they are the same person. Oh, nice. I like <laughs> okay. that. And what was his name in the movie? Uh, Tom, Tom Frost. Okay. I just watched it. Yeah. Okay. So Bilbo Frost? Bilbo Frost. Uh, okay. Uh, is that a palette item? Uh, okay. How about we add it this way? We'll add it as a yes. And then okay. we'll add Tom Frost and Bilbo Baggins share identity. They're the same. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, she's typing that up. Anthony, how about some nose? We can use some nose columns if you got one. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to add a no for um, uh, no uh, Sauron. There's a lot of names that are too close together, and I always yep. try to remember, am I saying the right one? Am I saying the mutant pterodactyl? Or am I saying the, <laughs> the white wizard? <laughs> right. Um, but uh, no existence of uh, Sauron. Um, okay, so Sauron, the Dark Lord. Yes, the Dark Lord. So let's let's say no Dark Lord figure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that would complicate things in our drug trip to like have impending doom. <laughs> it's a real downer. Uh, While well, he's typing <laughs> that up, uh, Napoleon, what you got? Yes, Elvish bread uh, gets you it. it, it nourishes you but it also gets you extremely high and there's kind of a black market for different types of elvish bread all right go ahead and type that one out and right. that would be a yes Let's see we need more nose more nose um no shooting people in the head <laughs> oh boy God, it, you know, with Burroughs' work was so inclusive. It's like, where are, where do you put the nose? Yeah, that's kind of. Alright, you guys talk amongst yourself. Why uh, I think. <laughs> All right. Um, I have very limited education on William S. Burroughs. Uh, so do you, either of you want to um, kind of hit me with some of the, the high points? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I've been tangentially exposed to stories and, you know, stuff like that. But um, this the source uh, I've been rapidly trying to read a wiki on. Uh, basically, he, he is just um, hypersexual surrealism, uh, very much drug fueled. He was a heroin addict. Uh, he did a lot of substances. He traveled a lot uh, from Morocco to Mexico to just kind of all over the place. Um, as I said before, he did shoot his wife, Joan, uh, in the head during a, a supposedly, he has two stories about it. it supposedly, it was the William Tell routine where she puts the, the glass on her head. Mm -hmm. And he was going to shoot it off, uh, but he was loaded at the time. And so was the gun, unfortunately. And so he uh, pointed it at her head and uh, missed, which is not terribly surprising, but he did it in front of several witnesses, including his child. Um, he was uh, charged for it, but he never served any time. They never felt like it, it was, he was in Mexico at the time that he did it. Um, and so he just kind of 
traveled the world, uh, was uh, friends with a lot of people in sort of the beatnik community, uh, Jack Kerouac, things like that. Um, so is he, is he kind of like a pre Hunter S. Thompson? He, he, he's in that same kind of genre, uh, but much more surrealist. Uh, mm -hmm. If you read his stuff, it's very disjointed. In fact, Naked Lunch, I don't know how they made a movie out of it because the book <laughs> uh, is a series of vignettes that are loosely autobiographical, but completely fantasy. Like he, he just mixes the two. Um, and you can read it in any order. If you want to pick it up in the middle and read like chapter eight, it, it, then you can go to chapter one or chapter 10. Uh, because none of them really hinge on each other. They're all just excerpts. Um, and most of his work, Wild Boys, Junkie, um, Naked Lunch, um, all of that kind of stuff, it is kind of in that same, like, hypersexual uh, and very drug-addled, very bizarre, surrealist fantasy kind of thing. Um, he was also uh, a closeted, not really closeted, but he was a homosexual, um, and so a, most of the sex scenes that you see are not between men and women, they're between uh, two men, uh, and had a predilection for um, younger men. Mm -hmm. uh, so he tends to, most, most of the men he describes are uh, younger prostitutes or things like that. So. Yeah, he was certainly the first person in media, <laughs> uh, modern media, to be forward about his sexuality mm -hmm. and his drug use. You know, you have to yeah. go all the way back to... Um, uh, who's the S and M guy? Uh, so, oh, Marquis de Sade. Yeah, like Marquis de Sade oh. to find a character who's comparable. I think. Right. You know, Lord Byron, maybe you put him in the slate too. But um, okay, so I've added no medieval institutions. <clears throat> so right. if you, so like the Rangers and the 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 Guardians of this and all that. If if there's an institution, it has to be cast in mid twentieth century terms. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, right. As. Yeah. Hmm. And we keep doing this until like we get comfortable with what we have. And, and when somebody says, I think we're done, then we'll just do one more pass and then we move on to the next phase. Okay. Um, I... Okay. Um, in the spirit of William S. Burroughs, uh, how about like a, like a no... sexual boundary sort of way like there's no um, orientation and it's not weird for there to be like interspecies like the eagles demanding sex for example because <laughs> um, it, it's all like it's all cool with them they're all cool with it all right all right i'm gonna add it as now all right thank you anthony Speaking of no sexual boundaries, Anthony, your turn. <laughs> Who told? <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, add a no for um, no, uh, like the, the the classic interpretation of like orcs as like savage and um, like brutalistic. I'd like to remove that completely mm -hmm. um, and I leave it up for anyone else if they want to kind of decide now or, or come up later with what the orc culture is actually like, but definitely not how it's always been portrayed in most all fantasy. Awesome. So no evil races, no inherently evil races. I forget what they're calling yeah, it. That. That's what I forgot. There's a big movement in fantasy role playing now to push against that. I'm for it. Um, the uh, yeah, orcs are are sort of the the. Uh, lin uh, not linchpin, but the, they're the archetypical evil race mm -hmm. in this. You know, Klingons have been moved, right? They, they in Star Trek, they become the noble uh, warrior race, and I think that's the direction people want to take orcs. All right, Napoleon, your turn. Okay, I know. Um, no non-sentient weaponry, as you had said with the alien typewriters or the beetle typewriters. <laughs> If you uh -huh. have a sword or anything, it's like the Flintstones. It's basically like a, a, some kind of living. So your sword is actually just a centipede with like razor legs that you just slap at people. And it's okay with this. <laughs> you have an agreement with something. It's a living. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so. Excellent. All right. And I'm going to take a pass. I think we got a, a full palette here, but everyone else right. is going to get a uh, one more. 
a shot at it. So, as what do you think? You, you don't have um, to add something. You can also agree that we're full and, and take a pass. I think I would like to add, as a yes, that um, despite there being a no Dark Lord figure, there is still a Ring of Power, mm -hmm. which is the best high you could possibly get okay. in all of Middle Earth. Go for it. And Anthony, last pallet item. Uh, I'd like to add that um, hobbits are extremely horny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a yes, horny hobbits. I misspoke, actually. Napoleon, you get the last uh, ad. Oh, okay. Um, so I would like to add that uh, the elves, seeing themselves as above everybody, uh, are trying to get away from everything sexual and they they practice this sort of like psychic elves. yeah they, they practice <laughs> psychic sex with each other like in demolition man basically and uh or in barbarella um <laughs> that that's what elves are into so all elf characters are kind of like oh you have you do the penis thing bruce <laughs> yeah. uh fluids did you mention Barbarella? Because it reminds me of Barbarella. It is, yeah. Barbarella yeah. <laughs> or Demolition Man. or There's a couple others where they do that psychic sex stuff. So, so I'll add that. Abstinent elves. All right. Excellent. So that is our palette. Oh, I did this a little out of order, but that's fine. So we're going to bookend history, uh, start and end points. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just propose one. Um, start point... Uh, Billy the Riddle hands down his needle kit to his how about we gender swap our Frodo figure niece yes Frito. <laughs> I was thinking Frida. Frida. Yeah, Frida. Yeah, well, Frida's good. Yeah. I I spelled niece so badly the spell checker has given up. Uh, someone help me out. N i e c e. All right, and does not look like the word geese. Okay. I get that grammarly, bud. I have language tool built in. It gave up on me too. <laughs> okay, Frida. Is is that cool? Yeah. Um, that seems like a dark thing. <laughs> All right. And then the end of it, I mean, sure, there, Lord of the Rings, the movies, went on for another 30 minutes after the, the throwing into the Mount Doom, but I think that's essentially the end of Lord of the Rings. Would you agree? So... Uh, the needle kit going in what? What do you guys think? A vat of semen that's been collected for the ages. So... That's where the elves put it because they don't put it into each other. Right, right. They yeah, have... yeah. Mm. They Which... also wouldn't just leave that laying around either. That would mean that the needle kit came from right. the semen. It was forged <laughs> from the semen. <laughs> Should we add that elf semen just gets you really fucking high? Elf semen oh. is the equivalent of heroin. <laughs> <laughs> is it too late to go back? <laughs> All right. Frida throws her needle kit into the elvish, uh, the ancient, let's make it ancient, elvish vat of semen. Is that light or dark? That's a good it's question. A <laughs> I, I think light, like that's mm -hmm. yeah, ultimately an accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go light. Putting down the needle. Mm -hmm. All right, so you guys see now there's two. The two cards have been added. Um, if you hover over them, there's a plus symbol in between. So if you we're going to be adding stuff between these, uh, we don't add them before or after, generally in this game. All right, so we've got our uh, our palette. We've got our. Um, beginning and end groups. So we are going to then 
This is not a formal turn, but we each take a, a pass adding a single event, it doesn't matter what, anything you, you want from that add, you know, contributes to this theme, uh, theme rather. And then those rules about like uh, focus will come in next turn. So Anthony, your turn. Um, let's see. So you can add periods and events, not scenes. Got it. Um, I'd like to. I'd like to add an event. I'm trying to just kind of visualize kind of the, that next beat when the fellowship comes together mm -hmm. after you know uh, Frida gets the needles and we kind of cement our group together um, I'm trying to think of a fun way to distort that okay go ahead and think about that yeah. um, and I'll talk to Az uh, so you just finished the, the comic book program I did yeah uh, how what what do you think the most valuable thing you learned from that was? Make friends. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to people. Um, I, I so, really like the program mm -hmm. at MCAD, uh, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and it's interesting being a comic uh, artist and writer in an art school like where they have formal art education mm -hmm. um so you're, but, like, you're, you're there drawing cartoons and there's somebody shipping yeah. with marble in the next room yeah exactly <laughs> exactly i'm drawing dumb cartoon shit sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to curse but yes please um okay <laughs> we, good. we have a bad of eight <laughs> elven seamen so I, think I don't know all the rules um, are off at this point well fuck uh yeah no it's <laughs> Um, it, it was, it was really weird, but ultimately, like, I realized, um, you know, in order to, to make the comics that I want to make and really get the most out of the experience, I had to, like, congregate with people who wanted to make the same stuff I did. So I met some really cool people. Um, and, you know, cartooning is a very lonely gig, so <clears throat> it's nice mm -hmm. having other people who are just as lonely as you. All right. Um, Frida meets the fellowship in a drug fueled orgy. All right. That's how our fellowship comes together. Okay. All right. Napoleon, what do you want to add? All right. Um, when we ask Elrond for his help, uh, the elves are actually incredibly horrified but we discover that Elrond is secretly a freak. So. Secretly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he, he has to hide it from the other elves, but he's like, yeah. Okay. I thought we were okay. making up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so would you say that's an event in, underneath the Fellowship of the Orgy? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, when we beg the elves for the, the help, we, yeah. Okay. Elrond's okay if he gets something out of it. So how do we frame that as an event? Hmm. Um, sex, sexually fulfilling Elrond is the linchpin that brings the elves in. And right. the other elves don't know that this is what happened. They just think like, oh, well, wise Elrond must have made an arrangement. It's like, no, why, wise Elrond did some naughty things. Okay, so now we don't <laughs> own, uh, there's a copyright on Elrond. So what's okay. the, what's the, uh, our our burroughs esque version of him going to be called um elroy all right after elroy <laughs> jetson oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right go ahead and type that up okay uh... and i will start thinking about mine go ahead and talk amongst yourselves as how long have you been um making comics um and not as long as other people um i mean theoretically i've been making comics my whole life but um i before i did comics i i did prose writing which was where i met tone we were in a writing group together and i worked in the news and then um i kind of decided fuck it i'm gonna 
make comics and moved out here basically to do that to like find my stride in it so it's only been a few years but you moved to minnesota to make comics well yeah i had to get away from the sunshine and reasons to be outdoors yeah it's it's awful it's awful (laughs) i get it I didn't know Minnesota had such a strong comic community. Uh, Minneapolis is actually um, filled with some really, really cool cartoonists. The Midwest in general. Um, well, the Lake like Minnetonka, know, I'm sure, just oozes creativity. <laughs> I don't know. That as an amazing lake. Like, be careful what you say about Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm for it. I'm for it. <laughs> yeah, it's no, just, um, everything I know about uh, Minneapolis pretty much comes from Prince. Uh, what about Rhoda? <laughs> I didn't yeah. watch that show. Rhoda went to art school. God, I'm so old. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Rhoda went to art school in Minneapolis. And uh, actually, Minneapolis has the most amazing modern art museum uh, probably in the country. I would sure say. does. The water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've heard that the art scene there is pretty cool and, and yeah. underestimated. It's, it's amazing. It's totally underestimated. Very cool. Yeah, that the whole coastal elitism, if you're not from New York or like LA, then people are just like, oh, but yeah, there's, there's art everywhere. (laughs) So yeah, there is um, that, that coastal elitism is interesting because it wasn't until I moved here that I realized like, damn, New Yorkers are really cool. (laughs) (laughs) I had such a bad impression of them before I moved to the Midwest, strangely enough. Where were you before? San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. The class with tone. So, though it could have been like a remote class. class. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. <laughs> the borders have all come down this far into the age of the internet. It's, it's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm adding an event underneath that first period. Uh, so after Billy the Riddle hands down his needle kit to his niece Frida, Silverback Jerry, shaman of the gray sky, comes to Frida and tries to convince her to drop her habit. Mm. Yes. All right. As you're up next. Okay. Oh wait, wait. Did we start with you? No. We started with Anthony. Never Not, mind. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. I personally uh, adore uh, Aragorn, our boy Aragorn. So. Um, I, I think in the uh, romancing Elroy, Mr. Elroy, um, Aragorn, Ar- Aragorn, I can't speak. Um, so the reason he and Arwen's uh, love is forbidden is because Arwen has real human sexual relations with a uh, real disgusting human whose semen is not worthy of the elvish fat of semen. Um, so in, in under the Elroy, I would like that the princess of the, the, uh, the elves is shamed and uh, I guess just like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? shunned shamed and shunned for normal sex and it's dark <laughs> <laughs> go ahead uh, type it up i'm gonna move uh so uh the romancing elroy uh became a period at the end i'm gonna move it to an event underneath uh, okay. the orgy period that's you know, the more i, I think about said. this the more I think about this vat of elven semen, the more I think that it is just this kind of primordial element in that it is not actual ejaculation from an elf, that they do not have ejaculation, mm-hmm. but somehow will go to this vat for any kind of creation <laughs> of new elves. It sounds like the elves are really into Tondra. <laughs> All 
All right, well, as he's typing, uh, Anthony, you are going to be the first focus. So of the elements that we have here, mm -hmm. um, proper mm -hmm. nouns, usually, usually it's a proper noun you pick, but sometimes not. Um, it could also be a theme. What do you want to focus on for this first round? Um, so within, I suppose, what we have is we've really built on kind of the first kind of half of the story, mm -hmm. uh, a focus kind of in, in that prim uh, primarily. Um, I would really like to put uh, a focus on something um, oh, does it have to be something that's already been established? Yes, it has to be something on the board already. Ah, okay, okay. Um, then I've got, I've got my next event. Um, let's see. But if there's something that segues from something on the board to what you no, want to bring in, you might. I, I think it's I way. think it's a new concept that's not really touched on the board yet. Okay. Um, I would like to put a focus. I keep coming back to Silver Jerry. Um, Silver uh, Silverback Jerry's constant meddling in uh, in Frida's <laughs> life mm -hmm. uh, and, and Frida's choice to um, pick up the needle mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and carry it with them at all times. Okay, so why don't we uh, refine it down to the relationship between Frida and Silverback Jerry? Okay. Um, define focus. There we go. So you are now, since you've defined the focus, you are the lens, which mm -hmm. means you get to uh, create two items to our plot. You can create uh, a period, an event, and a scene, and then you can also create a second one nested underneath that. So you can create okay. a period and event, or an event and a scene, or just one of those. Um, I think I want to do the uh, the event of the conflict between mm -hmm. Jerry and Frida. Okay. Um, and what, and what will would split the two of them. Um. The, the the point where Silverback Jerry uh, kind of, at least temporarily, gives up on uh, uh, on interfering with with Frida's lives after so long of constant beratement. <laughs> All right, while well, um, you're thinking of that, yep. uh, I'll give you some time to think of that. That, and then we'll talk to the ladies about. So you both self-published comics. Mm. Uh, what's something you learned from that experience? Hard <laughs> paper. Yeah. What was that? Word paper. Yeah. Now I I work digitally, but I uh, since my comic was about lucid dreams, I think uh, what I've discovered is, uh, and and I'm not writing it as much anymore because of this, um, that there's a lot of people out there who are creepy and stalkerish, um, who I have had set, said things to me like. Oh yeah, I had a lucid dream about you, and uh, you came to me in that dream, and you said this, and uh, now I'm contacting you in the real world. I'm like, do you think I'm like an idiot? No, you're you basically... said you'd never tell that story. <laughs> no, I had like uh, one guy say like, yeah, I astrally projected into your room and watched you sleep, and I'm like, how? Oh. How is that ever going to like turn it? Like, can you see yourself in a long term relationship with someone where you're explaining to your children like? So your father astrally projected into my room and watched me sleep. <laughs> it was so romantic. It's just the grossest, creepiest thing. And I think because of that, I uh, found myself really taking my focus away from the comic and mm. putting the focus onto mm. the podcast, which is more broad and ties in more with things that are very clear, like Sasquatch or mm. uh, werewolves or things. They're very clearly fantasy, whereas the lucid dreaming thing leaves the door open for some people who are really do, not mentally ill, but mentally disturbed kind of people. Who... Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately that's the last time that happens to anybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The internet's full of creeps. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. Especially for a lady. Yeah. Oh I, yeah. I haven't had anything remotely like that happen to me. I'll say that. 
Really? <laughs> I feel like people would just be hounding all over you, Tone. <laughs> well, I, I can curve out on you. I mean, online. Would that make want. you more comfortable? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I could use a couple more minutes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> go, go perv on tone. <laughs> yeah, I want to get into comics too uh, at some point, but the comics kind of, it feels like comics still need a physical medium, even on the Kickstarter genre. I mean, ha, well, YouTube may be more plugged in than I am. Is there people doing strictly digital comics? Even well, yeah, like, there's tons of people doing. Well, I know, I know, there's always comic, been like the web yeah. comic, um, but eventually that that business model needs to get to like a trade paperback. It seems. But yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people who are very successful with web comics that end up um, publishing the web comics, and that is what makes them money, but maybe not necessarily makes them or gives them a following. Um, mm -hmm. So there's uh, like a, there's a trade off with either one. Um, like I know some people who have been making comics for decades who still struggle to sell their um, physical comics. It's, and then, and then you have, you know, uh, like the Random House kids graphic novel imprints that just like instantly sell out 130 million copies of mm -hmm. something no one's ever heard of so <laughs> it's about time and place a lot mm -hmm. a lot yeah that's the marketing aspect of all this stuff is the most frustrating to me i've followed all the advice and none of it has worked and uh i need i've been following it so long that i i've deluded myself in thinking this is the only path to satisfaction not necessarily success and I need to sort of break that bond in my own head. I think so. Um, I mean, no one's ever going to have the, the right formula for instant mm -hmm. success, even yeah. if you make good stuff. Well, that ended up being kind of a downer. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just make what you love. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me follow that with this. Uh, so, uh, so the, the, the conflict um, in the relationship between Silverback Jerry and Frida um, is uh, largely centered around uh, Frida uh, being a real horny hobbit uh, and now have been, having picked up this uh, the needle and a drug habit. Um, and uh, this is uh, far too um, uh, uh, dangerous of a lifestyle uh, for Jiver Silverback Jerry to follow or uh, even condone from Frida. So Silverback Jerry uh, confesses their feelings for Frida uh, and says, oh. <laughs> uh, and says, um, put down the needle uh, and give up your horny hobbit life. Uh, and, you know, we can make uh, this, this new happy life together. Uh, but this horny hobbit just can't do so. Uh, and uh, leaves Silverback Jerry uh, in a, um, uh, a very uh, cliched, raining, uh, you know, <laughs> stormy night. Uh, robes just soaked as uh, Frida goes out for the next uh, fix of uh, elf semen. <laughs> All right. Uh, and where is that going to go? Um, <clears throat> so that uh, would, I suppose, come under the um, the event of Soberback Jerry. Uh, tries to convince her to drop her habit. Okay. Uh, so that would be a scene. Uh, do you want to act that out? Because it sounds like you've kind of defined it. Uh, I can be a verbose DM, so I put the line there. <laughs> uh, but if anyone feels like they've got anything they kind of want to uh, flesh out, uh, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be fine. And I um, add that as this uh, scene is unfolding, in the bushes, Frida's gardener slash sex slave, um, Sim, <laughs> um, comes to Silverback Jerry after Frida has left and, like, also says, I am also in love with Frida. All right. Is that, uh, is that all written up? Um, it could be if I understood how to do so. Right, so um, on the on the event, 
they were yeah. talking about the silver black cherry. Oh, there you, it you is. hover Great over it, scene. create scene opens up. Yeah. And I just type it all out in the scene. Yeah, if you would, please. All right, well, he's typing that. Uh, Napoleon, what do you got? So on the period of Frida throws her needle into the vat of elvish semen, mm -hmm. there is a rogue quilter who once was in possession of the needle kit, uh, and they're desperate to get it back to finish their quilt. <laughs> <laughs> What's the rogue quilter's quilt. name? Gladys. Right. Gladys. Yeah, yeah. perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, Previously yeah. known as Smattis. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and write that one up. So how are things in Minnesota nowadays? Has there been a a, a churn? Because it was riots just a few months ago. So yeah, we're fine. I mean, <laughs> none of the buildings that were burned down have been like rebuilt. Um, I mean, if you want to get into the politics of it, I can really bring you all down. But um, <laughs> for the most part, I think Minneapolis is pretty calm right now. Um, we, we're all just indoors, you know, it's cold, so nobody's going to want to be outside. So it's usually very quiet in the winter anyway. I come in, Minneapolis is calling off the riots because it's too cold. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like 14 degrees outside. Nah, dude, we're not doing this. <laughs> On the counterpoint, if you got a riot going, the opposition would stay home. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. Maybe something to think about. Uh, what are you working on now? Now that almost uh, don't want to be famous is out. I am working on um, a story you have actually read um, from a long time ago oh. called June for Short, and it's mm -hmm. going to be a series of comics that is going to take forever to publish. So I won't say anything much more than that. Mm -hmm. Are you are, are you going to do the web model, or are you going to just stay straight to print? Straight to print. Okay. I'm I'm a I'm a physical hold it in my hands kind of person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave you guys for one second and come right back. If right. That's okay. All right. Uh, dude, we got the cover. That's awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Awesome. Anthony has filled it up. Uh, buh, buh, buh. And oh, it's my turn. Oh, okay. You guys talk. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so as um, what is it uh, that kind of puts you on the focus of, of the specific type of comic book that um, I don't want to be famous kind of comes from? Um, I, I think I, I would have to say like if, um, if I had to define the kind of stories that I write, they would be um, stories that could happen, but uh, I totally made up. So it's, it's still like, uh, reality based and um, I don't want to be famous has a, a lot of like investigation into mental health and um, like societal roles and that sort of stuff I like to get into with my writing is just um, basically identity and uh, personality like an examination of society yeah yeah <clears throat> Um, in a, in a mildly, very mildly philosophical way. I'm not like too <laughs> high brain. Light enough to bring it up, but not, you know, dense enough to be criticized for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to like know anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you are like into the more mainstream sort of stuff. Like what kind of comics do you usually go to? Yeah. I've been, um, you know hooked on a kid in the 90s i get the x-men cartoon and like the batman animated mm -hmm. series so capes uh are absolutely my, kind of my number one um you know my my number one love uh and as i've become older uh i've come to find that really the best stories are the ones where your capes you know are dealing with 
you know, higher level concepts of morality or, um, you know, just like personal struggle. And it, it's not about punching the bad guy. It's about, Hey, that bad guy is kind of right. Like, uh, where, where do I stand now in this? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. then, you know, kind of side to that, um, like image comics has put out so many kind of cool, um, oh, yeah. fantasy sci-fi books, sagas, my, favorite book of the last like 10 years Dude. yeah it's so good uh and but you know avoids all that kind of major kind of tropiness of um mm -hmm. you know mainstream comic books as well as um you know just kind of sci-fi in general i think uh, i think it would fit real well with uh kind of what we're doing here a lot of come oh, talk, yeah. a lot of uh <laughs> a lot of weird shit on the screen i never realized the <laughs> correlation until now all right, uh, I've got an, a period. Uh, I added it between the, the drug-fueled orgy and the needle throwing. A broken-hearted silverback Jerry visits another shaman, White Streak Saul, for advice, but Saul traps Jerry in his Victorian mansion. <laughs> the the hows and whys are to be determined. All right, as you're up. Okay. Now that we have White Streak Saul, um, there's going to be an event mm -hmm. where White Streak Saul has hypnotically, has sexually hypnotized the king of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can't be king. We don't uh, have uh, we don't have medieval institutions. So what is he? Oh right, um, the well. I guess he's like the strong man. He's mm -hmm. the strongest man, uh, but he uh, is under sexual hypnosis and therefore there are um, large groups of people um, who fear White Streak Saul, mm -hmm. I guess. So White Streak Saul is a bad guy and there's a lot of people. Okay who are scared of him and scared of his sexual hypnosis. <laughs> uh, would that be, I mean, there's certainly a lot of themes of criminal underground in Burroughs' work, being drugs, being a criminal enterprise. Do you want to go that angle? Make him White oh, Streak Saul? Oh, yes. Like yeah, a, like, <laughs> White Streak Saul is the, uh, he's the, he's the dealer, man. There you go. He, like he runs it. Yeah, okay, done. Okay, go ahead and start typing that up. Uh, so Anthony, so it's the League of... Ridiculous, Ridiculous conversations. conversations. Okay. And and is that what it says on the tin? Is there more to that? Uh, no, that's pretty much it, dude. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, a, a podcast that uh, at first was just to kind of like, I need something to do. Um, I was at a spot where I, I kind of had no projects going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to um, some friends that I've I'd done different podcasts with uh, and that I enjoyed. Like, hey, let's just you know, have a general goof around podcast. This is, this is probably the first time I've done something that um, had such a, a, a production and was like put out into the world that also had no um, intent for any, any kind of um, grandeur or anything like n I, no expectations of this to produce anything uh, for me. For me but uh, i've still been doing it for four years mm -hmm. uh, but it's essentially uh me and uh three of the best people i know uh we sit down uh we talk about um recent events in our weird lives um and uh the uh ridiculous conversations typically come if not from whatever random thing that we've done or have experienced a list uh a growing list varying between 50 to i think we've gotten up to 80 topics uh, that are really the questions that you ask uh, yourself and your friends um, while you're kind of sobering up at a Denny's at 3 a.m. Uh, and you've really lost a lot of conscious thread of, uh, you know, what what's a reasonable thing to talk about? And your brain just kind of goes off uh, and, and debates who is the sexiest animated uh, anthropomorphic animal uh, out there. <laughs> let's debate this. Let's let's really come down to it. Daisy Duck, uh, it can't... but anyway, go on. <laughs> I mean, up there. Up there. <laughs> um, 
we do uh, we do have a woman on the podcast, Stephanie. So oftentimes it comes up when that topic came up. It's like, huh, not a lot of sexualized anthropomorphic dudes. Hmm. Uh, the the women's really you know they're the ones dressed up uh, in the in the hot dresses. So we've we've had to make uh, exceptions. Um, Bugs Bunny <laughs> in drag uh, <laughs> could could be considered sexy for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's it's mostly just uh, the the four of us kind of having a good time um and especially uh in quarantine where we all have now been separated you know we we've recorded um in the mansion here uh for most every episode now it's a lot of just kind of getting together uh and recently building um community with the people who do mm -hmm. you know regularly listen to us uh so we just uh, opened up discord um and uh have been kind of just looking to make a uh, a kind of entertaining, fun space where we can just make each other laugh. Awesome. Cool. All right, all right. And I see as has entered added her event. And... There's a little more definition in the event if anyone okay. wants to. Cool. I'll read it off. And I haven't been yeah. switching back and forth on the board enough yet, so that's a good time to do that. White Streak Saul is a drug lord who controls the elven semen trade and has sexually hypnotized the strong leader of the roaming plains tribes. All right. All right, uh, Anthony. So you are, uh, like I said, you were the the lens for this focus, which means you get one more churn on this focus, and then we'll uh, pass it to Napoleon, who'll create a new focus. Um, as this is your last churn, you get to do the same thing again. You get to create unnested two events or just a single event, if you like. Okay. All right. Uh... And I'll let you think about that. Yeah, please. Uh, Napoleon, what kind of technologies do you do when you do when you put your production together? Oh, I use uh, iMovie. I actually went to school for multimedia in my second degree. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I learned how to use Final Cut Pro and all the professional stuff. But then when I got actually out there, uh, people who actually work in the industry, they don't make enough money to buy all the software <laughs> and the yeah. technology. Yeah. yeah. So unless you work for a firm that's giving it to you, you kind of have to make do with what you have. So I trained myself to do iMovie and Photoshop basically. And so uh, for my animations, I just draw a series of thing in Photoshop, kind of put it on onion skin where I can see back and forth. And I basically do animatics because animations would take too long to render out with iMovie because it's mm -hmm. basically just image, 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 image. Mm -hmm. And then already the render time is like two hours with just animatics. Um, and so I use iMovie to edit my podcast, to edit my animations, which uh, I started tying in just this season because when I was talking to people about the podcast and like, hey, have you listened to it? It's, uh, yeah, we interview this person who's a writer and they're really cool. We interview this guitarist and they're like, it's kind of crap, man. But your art's dope. So yeah. And I was like, okay, well, apparently my art is dope. So I should bring the art into this. So now I do for the audio drama, I do original episode art for everything. And, and then I can help publicize that. And then I also do these animations that tie into Creeping Wave, the audio drama at the opening of every podcast mm -hmm. uh, to try and bring in that art to the uh yeah, to just tie it all together, try to get people to become a little more interested. And then maybe people will only just watch for the animation at the beginning, but then maybe they stick around a little bit longer and then they're like, oh, actually this guy, Tone Malazzo, has got something going on. He's kind of a looker, I'm into that. And uh, speaking of lookers, Anthony, um, on your anthropomorphic men, you were forgetting Shere Khan from Tailspin and Basil <laughs> of Baker Street, two foxy gentlemen. Debatably, if Shere Khan would be considered uh, anthropomorphic, since mm. they're still walking on all fours. No, 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 in Tailspin. Oh, good point. Yep, mm. got me there. Got me there. Yeah. <laughs> Did you really resist that if that came into your room? I Powerful can't... man in a suit. I don't know, man. The size of those hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll be right back. Right. <laughs> oh, as you leave, leave your Zoom back on. As I think. Thank you. I think it's on. It breaks. It breaks the format if uh, if a camera goes away. Fortunately, you were in the bottom corner, what so that she worked out just fine. It? But <laughs> yeah, cool. Thank you. 
Um, yes, that's something I should have included in the opening. Uh, uh, Napoleon, when this is all over, remind me to send you a link to this sort of uh, how-to video do rotoscoped style animation. Oh, so you sweet. Might, you might have some value out of that. That might save me some time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, what do you do for audio editing? For audio editing, um, I do Audacity. Um, and I'll do like a uh, noise reduction and like sample out of sound in the background and stuff like that. Um, the biggest issue I've been having recently is the fan for my laptop comes on mm. and the microphone, I can't get the microphone far enough away. Right now the microphone's over here mm -hmm. to keep it away from that fan. But I was interviewing someone and they're like, it sounds like a hairdryer just turned on. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so, but um, yeah, and so I'm working with that, but sometimes I can sample out the sound, but if you sample it too much, you get this magical jingling in the background. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's not great, but um, I use Audacity and then I bring uh, the file into uh, iMovie, which also has a noise reduction feature uh, that it, it works pretty well, honestly, but uh, sometimes it takes out too much and you get kind of muffled sounds. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to do a combination mm -hmm. of those. Um, and uh, I just use a Yeti and a Snowball. I have a Snowball when I have somebody else here. Mm -hmm. I'm eventually hoping to get like a mixer so I can have two channels coming in at once. Because uh, what I've noticed is that I have people when I'm interviewing them that their sound will be really soft mm -hmm. and I can't really control for that. So I'd like to be able to boost their sound up a little more instead of just going through and actually just going through the whole audio file and lifting up like individual sections. Where... Yeah, you can keep them separate. That's what I'm trying yeah, to do. Yeah, then, then that yeah. gives you a lot more freedom to just work whole blank with that. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was doing podcasting, I would also go through there and take out all the ums and uhs, mm -hmm. which was draining. Ooh, uh, yeah, so much work. But it, it did make everyone sound much smarter. <laughs> because Especially I have myself, the video. When I was doing the podcasting, <laughs> I would start with stammering every time I started to speak. And I had to cut all that yeah. out. Because I have the video component, uh, mm, that's yeah, not as that much of an option. Yeah, that would be jarring if you did that. Yeah, and <laughs> so was it like would Max just... Headroom. Yeah. And uh, so I, I don't do that. But uh, when I first started, I did go through and if anybody left a space, like they'd be like, well, hmm. <laughs> and now the only time I really do it is because we have a mix of improv and actual interview. So if we're having somebody do an improv and they're like, wait, wait, I, I don't want to. No, let me do that over again. Then I'll be like, OK. And then I'll like edit that section out and piece it back together. Um, so and we're hoping to do more improv and scripted this year. Uh, cause they, I like doing the interviews, but they're, um, kind of taxing on me emotionally. Mm -hmm. Just, I, I'm not, I'm not a conversationalist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so it, podcasting is good because I'm in control of the conversation. Um, and most of the time the guests are like, you know, good and cooperative and that kind of thing. But then every once in a while you have someone like, well, well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Why don't you go wash off all that makeup off your face and show me what you really look like. And then I'll tell you if I want to fuck you. And then I'm just like, oh, I, well, that was never a question that came up. Yeah, that's not, that's not relevant. But yeah. That's... And so sometimes you have that, and, and that has to be edited out, obviously. Mm -hmm. That's something but, I'm worried about with this oh, channel right here is I'm going to be mm -hmm. opening it up to people I just don't know. Mm -hmm. And what if we get like an hour and a half into recording and they go psycho on me? Like it's happened. To throw the whole thing yeah. out um, just, or just you, cut you it off can, there. You can usually, yeah. Uh, I, I have had only one interview where I just had to cut it off. Mm -hmm. um, and that person was very belligerent. And I, I can't say that they were drunk or anything, but they were just very belligerent. Um, most of the time I can edit around it and then I'll just send them a message and be like, Hey, I just want to let you know that this section where you were talking about, you know, prostitutes, we're not going to be putting in and that kind of thing. So, but I have had a couple of people get crazy. I've had some people afterwards get screwy with think that, that we're way more connected than we are and start like texting. And I was like, Hey, you only have this number so I could get a hold of you on the podcast. I don't want anything to do with you and your wife, man. It's <laughs> oh, wow. So Yikes. But, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a little nerve wracking. It's better when I do the characters, because if it's a character, there's this limit there, there, there's, I'm interviewing a character. I'm not interviewing you. Mm -hmm. I don't have invested interest in you. I have interest in the, and then the character goes away and then 
ties are cut. And so it's, it, that's easier for me. Um, but I, I think that the internet has just created this blurry boundary for people where they don't know, like, are we friends? Are we going out? Are we doing this? And it's like, well, the answer well, is no. <laughs> with social media, we're all characters on the internet. Yeah, yeah pretty <laughs> yeah. much. So. Yeah, it's it's. I do try and consider that like what I present myself on social media is a character that I'm playing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I have that advantage of uh, two advantages. A, I don't go into any kind of uh, sexual content of any kind. Mm -hmm. So I don't open that door to anybody. But also being my age, gender, size, uh, I don't have that kind of problem in real life. I, and right. even still, I don't have it on the internet. For some reason, people are still intimidated by me for some reason. So. I, I am intimidated by you. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've added an event. All right. Um, uh, tagging off of uh, White Streak Saul being the drug lord who controls the elf semen trade um, and uh, hypnotizing, controlling the uh, strong leaders. I've added that White Streak Saul threatened by Frida's discovery of the elf come vats. And the source of Saul's control sends Brother Amir to stop Frida, but instead falls in love from afar. <laughs> there is, there's already like a thousand times more romance in this than there was in the original <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> this is, there's a lot of romance in, in Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> I just, I've really been trying to find a place to put Boromir. <laughs> All right, so that was that focus. Uh, that was an all uh, Anthony being the lens. So we circle back uh, one step. And as you are able to establish a legacy, so pick one thing that's on the board and create one event, scene, or period relating to it. Okay. Um, I will choose Gladys, the rogue quilter. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the legacy being that um, before Gladys was a rogue quilter, um, she was she was working for White Streak Soul, um, but she got hooked on his product and she made a break for it and has been seeking the vat of elf semen on her own mm -hmm. this whole time. Okay. So. Is that, that sounds like an event. Where does that go under? Um, if it correlates I think to, that to actually, go ahead. I think it's, it goes as well under the, um, the third period. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, go ahead and add that. So Anthony, going back to your podcast, if you if your podcast is about comparing, you know, things that you do in your life, do you ever like, oh shit, I got a recording session, I haven't had anything stupid happen. Let me uh, go steal some women's underwear or something. Uh, no, um, I keep that to my private life. Um, <laughs> but we do regularly, and this was much easier when we were all in the same room. Um, but we have uh, like reoccurring like bits, um, uh, primarily the you talk while I eat this, where we'll <laughs> find something weird <clears throat> um, or, or not so weird, but just like novel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're big fans of the flavored Oreos. Mm -hmm. So typically the seasonal Oreos come through and we'll try those out. Um, well, that's, most... that's like 100 episodes right there because... It's a lot. I've had a lot of Oreos, <laughs> um, but only one of them sent one of our uh, podcast members to the hospital to have their appendix taken out the next day. Oh my gosh. Um, the, how were they eating the it? The Oreos <laughs> are now notorious on the podcast uh, for just being the most uh, dangerous form of Oreo. Which Oreo was it again? The Peep Oreo. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we don't go into them knowing, like, oh, this is a good combination. We go in like, well, this is weird. <laughs> yeah. Most recently, we tried thick water for the first time. Oh. Um, oh, oh. Yeah. What is thick water? It's exactly what it sounds. It's 
slightly gelatinous kind of uh, uh, water. Um, think of like, like, like yogurt, okay. or, or s- similar to that consistency, but still drinkable. Like crystal yogurt. Kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's gross. What it's are they trying real to sell gross. with that? Like, what's the well, angle? Is it collagen or? Like... Apparently, like the use for it is that some people have difficulty swallowing. So I guess making it thicker is supposed to be helpful to them. That goes against my logic, but uh, it, they do sell like thickener for um, older patients who have a hard time swallowing things. So it's just you just add yeah. thickening agents. Like I, I have no problem swallowing, and uh, this stuff was just tough to take down. <laughs> um, it it was surprisingly salty, uh, and real difficult we we each got a little bottle um and only one of us managed to finish it mm. um i uh i put a little uh, crystal light flavor squirt into it and it literally just sat inside of it like suspended animation just this kind of wow. mystic uh uh swirl of color inside of it um so yeah so when when we don't necessarily have anything going on um or we're just looking for something weird. Uh, we go to the internet, uh, and, and typically now we just order things off of Amazon uh, <laughs> with most success. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the most punishing thing that we've done is uh, in September we do no swears September, <laughs> where anytime anyone cursed in debatably like between a G and a PG rating. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to take a uh, bean from the Birdie Bots beans from Harry Potter oh. that's got like the vomit flavor and you know, earwax and stuff like that. Um, it's 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 a fun time, but vomit jelly bean is real gross. Yeah, and there's no getting around it. Well, I mean, at least it, it lives up to its name. Yeah. All right, uh, as you do, oh, that, I see you added the event. Let me switch over. And here we are. Go, you want to read that off for us? Sure. Gladys, the rogue quilter, used to be a drug runner for White Streak Saul, but broke away from Saul's sexual hypnosis to seek the ancient vet of elvish semen on her own. All right. So I like how the, the when I added needle kit, I meant like a heroin needle kit, but it's become also... Oh. A, the, <laughs> this well, you craft. can use heroin needles <laughs> yeah. to craft it's become a little ambiguous i i think it's no this is actually like this is kind of the point of this game is that um you leave things a little bit open-ended and see where people take it so the idea of you know (laughs) shooting up and then pulling the needle out and just you know doing a a couple pearls why not yeah all right uh napoleon you are now the lens Mm. what would you like to be the focus uh, I would like Gladys to be the focus. All right. Because uh, Gollum was always my favorite character in Lord of the Rings. All right. Well, that's so. simple enough. So go ahead and hit uh, mm-hmm. Define Focus. And actually, I'll go ahead and do that for you while you think about um, what... No, you have... Uh, now, the, like I said before with Anthony, you have, as a lens, you have the option to add either one or two nested um, events, periods, scenes, etc., up to you. Okay. All right. So there we are. We got Gladys the Rude Quilter is now our focus. Mm-hmm. We should have the meeting of Gladys. So. Oh. But yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, Gladys. I don't think is invited into the orgies and things like. Kind of has to stay back from all of that stuff. Well, you would add a, a larger period then here somewhere. Yeah. That would be a frame for that. All right. So Freedom meets fellowship during a drug fueled orgy, um, broken hearted. So I guess uh, after broken hearted G- silverback Jerry, mm-hmm. we will add a period in the meeting of Gladys. And that is ultimately dark, I guess. So. And okay, so let's uh, let's flesh that out a little bit. So mm-hmm. Frida and what was the guard? Oh, 
Frida Sim. and Sim cross paths with Gladys. Mm-hmm. We're, we're in Frida, and Frida and Sim are heading towards the mountain or the the vat of semen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, how do so how do they cross paths? What's so I guess Gladys has been following them mm-hmm. all of this time, uh, leaving little trinkets for them, you know, like um, pot holders, and uh, <laughs> meaning the pots that you cook in. Um, yes, not and, clips. Okay. Yes, yes, and uh, so so like little trinkets, uh, tea cozies uh, left along that she is knit, but uh, she she wants to get her little paws on that fearsome needle kit that mm-hmm. uh, she she craves and so as they're discovering these tea cozies and these mm-hmm. pot holders and mittens and all sorts of things that they they come across Gladys who's ultimately been leading them to her mm-hmm. and trying to win their favor say like I can guide you to the vat of semen okay so, so why don't we mm-hmm. uh, make the period of uh, Frida and Sim follow Gladys's path of uh, knitted trinkets. Okay. And then uh, underneath yeah, underneath that, the event would be the actual discovery of Gladys. And you might want to flesh that out a little bit more than that even. Okay. Okay. And so then we add event. Right. Discover Gladys. And then add an event to that. Oh, no, Gladys. that's good. That's good. You got a period oh, okay. and an event. All right, cool, cool. And we're good. All right. All right. All right, so it's my turn. All right. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to need some thinking here. All right. Nap? Yeah. Uh, who is uh, of the characters that uh, you've you've had on uh, both Creeping Wave uh, and the You Mind? Uh, okay. Who's been your favorite character, and why is it Tybalt? <laughs> uh, it, it actually is Tybalt, um, and uh, I'm kind of obsessed with cats. I just love cats and everything cat related, and I have for almost all of my life. Um, and uh, the whole concept of a talking cat, like when I was younger, I used to make my cats talk. And I actually used to get in trouble because I'll wake up at three in the morning to draw and write and things like that. And my cats would be roaming around and I'd be like, uh, hey there, what you drawing? And be like, oh, nothing. How are you? <laughs> oh, that's a good picture. I like that. I don't like it. It's not colorful enough for me. And my parents would be like, what are you doing? You know, it's like, like the cats and me are conversing. <laughs> and uh, so when you had pitched the character of a talking cat, um i was just like yes this is something we want to do and then we started doing it with the you mind and uh i just really liked the character you have kind of a warner herzog kind of cat that uh wants to dominate the world and uh, (laughs) um i just think such a great character and um, i'm hoping to bring him into the next season too um that is based on a story i wrote and I, I, it was a young adult story, and I never tried to publish it because I, I just have such bad luck with things. That, uh, it, but my uh, partner, my old scratch, uh, my boss back there, he really believed it, and he said, "I really want you to bring this story into the Creeping Wave universe because I, I have faith in it, and I think it's a good one, and it, it opens the door for like a lot of characters to come in as cameos and a lot of people to do different things without giving away too much of what's going on. But um, I was always a little uncomfortable with the young adult format because when I was submitting, people would say like, this would be great as a young adult book because it deals with the themes of like uh, ostracization and not belonging and being different, except that you have some weird raunchy shit going on and i was like yeah that's kind of what i do and um yeah yeah so i (laughs) so with with creeping wave because it's more audio um that kind of stuff isn't as disturbing to people i think as it is when you're reading it and, and it's like purely your imagination with the sound effects and stuff it almost like is a damper 
that it, it almost becomes funny when you just have sound effects for weird things going on and stuff like that. So we haven't really had any hardline sex scenes on Creeping Wave, just because yet. Uh, yet, yet. It just, <laughs> just feels rude to ask somebody like, okay, so I want you <laughs> to basically have Zoom sex with me. Um, <laughs> You just haven't asked the right person. That's true. <laughs> All right, I've got. Uh, I added an event. It's underneath the uh, the drug fueled orgy, which I, I think this actually takes place after the orgy's over. But um, as everyone's left, Gladys on the trail of the needle kit captures and interrogates Elroy, binding him in yarn and leaving him to be discovered by the other elves to his shame. Ah. Good. Very nice. nice. I like it. All right. As your Maybe turn. that chunky knit yarn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Because <laughs> they're freaks. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, under Frida and Sam follow the path of knitted trinkets. Uh, and upon discovering Gladys, Gladys leads them to uh to the den of Hirob, who is a giant spider creature with penises for legs and he spins the yarn that gladys uses for her quilts nice all right so let's make that a scene underneath that event okay I was still warming up to the idea of doing the 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 role playing scenes. So why don't we just? Uh, I just have so much to manage, to you know to to put all that down and pick up a character, and then put that down again and pick everything up again. I think is a bit much for me. Um, but um, if anyone else feels like role playing that scene that I just put down, we can do that, or she can just write it up. I can play Gladys. Yeah, I just have the setup here. Uh, you know, <laughs> what's the question? What's the answer? <laughs> let's, yeah, let's I can be a go penis legged uh, tarantula. <laughs> All right, why don't we just uh, go ahead and write it up then? I think that's probably better <laughs> overall. Eventually, all this will be automated and we'll just whisk away and everything will take care of itself. All these technology so so solutions feel like one of those plate spinning g gags. Yeah. Where you got to keep moving around. I got to make sure yeah. everything stays up. Uh, Anthony, are you on, on any of your podcasts? Are you doing live role playing, actual role play? Um, I've debated it a lot. Um, actually, funny enough, uh, maybe eight, what year is it? Seven, eight years ago. Um, when I was doing, uh, I was doing a comic book theme podcast where we were doing reviews and, um, you know, kind of discussing news and stuff. Um, my buddy I was working with at the time, uh, he said, Hey, have you ever thought about, uh, recording your D and D sessions with your, with your friends? And we'd make that a podcast. And this is like 2013 or, or so. And I'm like, it seems so boring. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone would ever listen to that. Uh, I, I don't know how, how you could make, how you could capture the fun of the table, uh, for for anyone to listen, and now I'm just like, man, I was a fucking idiot. I could have been the first Critical Role, and and have done all that. Uh, now I listen to f like five different podcasts of, the, of that vein, and I've thought about it because I love storytelling. Um, I love the fun at the table in in role playing games, and just kind of like this communal kind of creation. Mm. I love being creative. What stops me is that there's no way I could not be happy with it if I wasn't putting a bunch of production into it mm -hmm. and like having to put in like background score and sound effects. <laughs> and I kind of hate uh, editing an hour and a half podcast every week. You can't hire Hans Zimmer. You don't have that kind of money yet. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he owes me a favor, but not that big. <laughs> um, so it'd be it'd be super cool. So now I just kind of like poke my nose around and see, hey, does anyone like want a dude who can do some voices uh, and enjoys playing uh, playing <laughs> games? Because I don't want the responsibility of <laughs> making the thing. Are you familiar with the term fantasy heartbreaker? 
Uh, no, I don't so, think I am. Um, you see, when you go to the game store and you see a role playing game that is like ninety percent D and D, and you know this person has played a lot of D and D, and they like, hey, I'm going to create my own game and put my house rules in there. Oh yeah. Not thinking that nobody's interested in your house rules, right? Uh, if I'm going to play a fantasy D and D game, I'm going to play D and D. So, uh, I since god since the 80s these games have been coming out where they've you know, clearly put a lot of time and effort and money into the production but you know there's just no market for it because dnd owns that i think yeah. critical role and the actual play dnd podcasts are kind of the same where everyone looks at critical role and says oh all they're doing is is playing dnd i can do that and not realizing that that's six professional voice actors is yeah really yeah. what's drawing in that audience yeah and in 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 the world of like um I mean, the the tabletop RPG world has expanded so much with so many different kind of games. Mm -hmm. But especially when you're looking at like just kind of the more narrow D and D Pathfinder kind of versions that are like real combat heavy games, you have a lot of your players who love that role play stuff and will make the stories on the spot. And you got a lot mm -hmm. of people who like to hit things real hard <laughs> and like feel like the power gamer. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like you know the the ease of doing it you got to get the right cast of people in there mm -hmm. and i've never sat at a table where i'm like every one of these people could make the podcast <laughs> maybe a couple of them you know because the the strength is the narrative not the the mechanics of you know swinging the sword real good mm -hmm. all right as looks like you're done i am i got it all right, i answered the question all right perfect <laughs> go ahead and read it off <clears throat> so the scene is where does Gladys take them after meeting them? Uh, Gladys leads them to the den of Hero, the giant human spider with penises for legs, who spins the yarn that Gladys uses to make her quilts. Then Hero uses his yarn to bind Frida and Sim into a BDSM style imprisonment, leaving the trail open for Gladys to find the elvish vat of semen without impediment from Frida or Sim. <laughs> nice. All right. And we are now on to Anthony. Uh, all right. I've been thinking about it. I want to get back to uh, Silverback Jerry and okay. uh, White Shriek Saul all in right. the Victorian mansion. All right. Uh, now, <laughs> now, keep in mind, the focus is still Gladys, so it's got to touch Oh, oh my bad, now. my bad. Um, I got obsessed with <laughs> what I was thinking there. Um, so Gladys now... Um, I'm going to go, I think, back to one of my previous ideas I'd written down. Okay, I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. Yeah. yeah. You know what, actually, uh, so I said, just watched Naked Lunch again. I saw it when it first was in theaters in the early 90s. Ah. And yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead and laugh how old I am, ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, yeah, like, you. I've seen, I, I know which movies you've seen in theaters. <laughs> like, that comes up in conversation often. <laughs> Um, when I first saw it, I had no idea that the mugwump's head was covered in dicks. No. <laughs> Did not make an impression on me. Oh, you a, know my so, Burroughs is such a weird niche of science fiction. You know, yeah. these are definitely science fiction tropes, and yet he was oh yeah in a completely different scene entirely. Like very few people. And you think, like, going all the way back to the 50s, that that bridge would have stayed open. Mm -hmm. But you don't see it opened up again until, like, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Yeah. Uh, to literature. And this is just a snobbishness. I've known, I've talked to people who are in MFA programs who dealt with it there. You know, they wanted to write genre fiction, um, but they're dismissed uh, as being commercial, ironically. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, th I think it's like there's sort of this fear um, when it comes to science fiction of like if I go too far then people won't get it which mm -hmm. like was not Burroughs's concern at all he was just like <laughs> I'm just gonna fucking do this I don't think he had a concern in the world except for to give his next no <laughs> yeah yeah um, there's also like so a, a subtext did. of his life is the, the the amazing amount of privilege wealth can get you um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, he, he literally spent years doing heroin in an apartment in Algiers or something like that, and that was his life. He just stopped doing heroin, not because it killed him like most people would, but just because he got bored of it. 
Yeah. Kind of crazy. You know where I first, uh, the my first introduction to William Burroughs was actually my mom. So, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. She gave me this book of uh, like beatnik writers because she was really into that scene when she was younger. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I don't, she, <laughs> things you don't ask your mom, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> but she was, um, and so she, she gave me this whole thing. And like of all of them, the one that stuck out to me was Burroughs, right? And uh, because it was just so weird. And later yeah. I was dating this guy and uh, he had this uh, collection of um, snippets and they were mostly from Naked Lunch, but they had like Spare Ass Annie, the guy who taught his asshole how to talk. Um, then uh, the Bobo, the wise old queen, what became of Bobo. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it had all these, and I guess William Burroughs himself actually read them. Uh, and I remember just like listening to it and thinking like, wow, it's really, this is really like cool. Like I, I just love like how crazy and fun and like to hear the author's own voice. And I saw Naked Lunch, I think came out in 91, mm-hmm. didn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... Um, so, uh, and uh, I, I saw it on video, but uh, I didn't see it in, in the theater. But, uh, and I remember just really being obsessed with the, the pure weirdness of it. Just looking into somebody's dream world and that and that that's always what I liked about girls was that they, they were, it was so unhinged and it wasn't with any tie to convention or any morality. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tend to uh, I really enjoy Oscar Wilde as well, who had that belief in aestheticism, that mm-hmm. art is mm-hmm. above morality, that there is no morality to art, <laughs> mm-hmm. that art is supposed to provoke you. It's supposed to intimidate you. So art writing that kind of stuff you can't hold it to those kind of confines you can't say like well this isn't a moral thing to write about or this could upset people it's like it's supposed to right. it's mm-hmm. supposed to upset right so no. do you think burroughs ever remembered writing what he wrote like know. if he was reading it again he'd be like oh wow that's a good line man <laughs> I think in, in in one of the things i did researching for this i think there was an instance where he said he claimed he didn't remember writing something I yeah. think good, chunk, <laughs> good chunks of, of Naked Lunch probably was it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I'll have to say, it, compared to how we approach literature today, it is about as pure an art, artistic endeavor as you can, right? Because uh, I don't know if uh, he understood what it took to write commercially at any level, because clearly none of that was on the page, including no. like the, the cut up method. Like, who the hell does that? Yeah. And it's so hard. I think we are so conditioned in commercialism now with like constant barrage of advertisement and consumption Mm -hmm. that it's really hard to to um, separate ourselves from that as artists. Oh, yeah. Um, Just even just the constraints of genre. You have to you have to pick a genre. Mm-hmm. And if you don't pick the right one, then you limit yourself. But you also open up doors. Well, which do you want? Uh, is is the door you open up as valuable as the door you just closed? This is all stuff you have to consider before you you, know, you, you go out to to the marketplace. And if you're non-genre, that's a that's a genre itself. Mm-hmm. And it's not very popular. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, all right. I think it was seen right. Okay. Let me see. Where is it? Well, no, I was asking. I can I can do a scene right. Yeah. I got one in my head. Okay. Uh, okay. So I want to expand on uh, Gladys on the trail of the needle captures and interrogates uh, Elroy, binding him in yarn and leaving him to be discovered by the other elves to his shame. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that interrogation, um, I want uh, Gladys to have found uh, Elroy kind of midst his kink of, um, uh, of, of leather gimp suits. Mm hmm. And uh, and kind of catching him at this uh, vulnerable time where he is uh, strapped to um, a uh, kind of a stretcher. Um, I forget what those are called. Gurney. Um, hmm? The cross. Oh. <laughs> no. Um, where they would torture people and like pull them uh, kind of oh, arms and legs. The rack. The rack. Yeah. yeah. The rack. Uh, Not that rack. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, finds him in this uh, uh, kind of vulnerable position uh, and Gladys being the uh, seamstress that she is tortures Elroy by uh, 
uh, ripping the stitches of his other leather uh, <laughs> suits uh, until he completely caves, uh, giving the information. Uh, and Gladys leaves uh, Elroy in a knitted uh, gimp suit to his now shame of his own perversion for the other elves to find. Nice. Amazing. Beautiful. I'll, I'll write all that down. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll keep you busy. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, Napoleon, you are still the lens, so you get to touch on this uh, focus one more time. Okay. And we are at the an hour and a half. I think we'll have enough time for one more round. I feel Gladys should have a heartbreaking musical number, Tom. <laughs> sure. Why not? Uh, it would not she... be the weirdest thing in Burroughs, so here. <laughs> where she reveals how she's just a victim of her addiction. And yes. So. Okay, well, you're I typing... Guess... Uh, are you going to be able to? Are you, you pretty much have that, or are you going to type it? This up? an event, pretty much. Uh, where where's it go under? I'm I'm thinking it goes under uh, when they they discover Gladys, and then she breaks into a musical number uh, about how she's just a, a victim of her addiction, and the vat of semen calls her name, and she wants so much more yeah. from this provincial life, and kind of thing. Okay, so. so that's under the Frito and Sim follow the path? Mm-hmm. Okay. So as do you, do you draw on paper or do you draw digitally? I draw on paper. Mm -hmm. I do all of my own work traditionally, mm -hmm. um, but currently where I work um, as a publishing assistant, I do all of that digitally. So I'm like first enough in both but personally i am very much uh obsessed with like the craftsmanship of making something on paper and then transferring it to mm -hmm. uh digital so that i can print it you know i was once at the calvin and hobbs well, was like the cartoon museum in san francisco and they had a calvin and hobbs mm -hmm. exhibit so they had the originals there and just Ooh. the amount of whiteout caked over oh yeah some of those was astounding i was like how the hell did this even get transferred because there's so much texture on that page yeah that's uh that's what my pages look like <laughs> <laughs> um so what do you feel like you get days. from that that you you're not getting out of digital um i just don't know how to there's a certain look in the way i uh, hold a pen that I just feel like doesn't translate hmm. in um, digital and I think part of it is the white of the paper it, it just it's so different from the white of uh, the screen and I do have a lot of limitations with um, it, uh, like working traditionally like I don't get to just uh, like control X control Z or hmm. undo like if I fuck up, I am getting an X-Acto knife and cutting that little scene out so that mm -hmm. I can draw it again and again and again. So I end up drawing things more times traditionally mm -hmm. in order to get it just right. And I think that um, sort of limitation actually makes better drawings. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a completely, I, I, I think I understand enough how to draw with pen and paper having been through grade school. Um, but I've seen some, <laughs> some digital artists work and the, the process is very different where it's draw a line, undo, draw a line, undo, draw a line, undo, mm -hmm. draw a line. Okay, I got it. Now move on to the next line. And, it looks and technically like... I do do that. Yeah. Just with <laughs> blue pencil until I get the right line. Mm -hmm. um, and I do everything black and white. I don't use any color in my work. So um, I don't have to like pay for really expensive paints or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not to like say digital art is not good because that's not true. Um, it's just my digital art is not good. <laughs> I've watched um, like the the artists that I follow on on Instagram, and to see their their digital you know works in kind of the sped up time, and having like illustrated through high school and and early in my adulthood to watch them like you know draw all the basic shapes and then to go back and just like free transform like eh, proportions a little off where 
I would have to erase and go back. And now my circle wasn't as good as the first one, but the shape <laughs> is right now. And I, I, I get so frustrated to think, man, that looks too easy. But every time I ever tried to put a, um, uh, a Wacom tablet and try and get out it doesn't it doesn't feel the same it feels disconnected mm -hmm. from what you're making mm -hmm. and I, I mean i never got the handle of it period yeah yeah i i think i never got past the hate part yeah yeah i mainly i also use a light them. table a lot so. oh nice right, Pauline, what do you what are you drawing oh i i use a wacom uh the the big tablets the mm -hmm. uh that you actually draw directly on. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me two years to save up enough to get it. But mm -hmm. um, when I first got it, I felt the same way that there was just, uh, it was slippy and it, it didn't feel like paper and I didn't feel like I had the same control. Uh, and so my earlier stuff, um, I, I can see the difference in it. Um, and I, it doesn't, it didn't feel comfortable to me, but I, I just basically, uh, I'm in a position where I do artwork for this one podcast that I used to do the web comic for, and I do something every week. Um, and they were in a thing where they, uh, really wanted to compete with multiple artists and have, um, I used to just be the one artist who did the episode art and they wanted to compete with multiple artists. And it really challenged me to where I have to do something better than everybody else. And I have to do it by the end of the week. And so I yeah. like, forced myself because of that. And so it was actually a, a very stressful time, but it, it was very helpful creatively for me. And uh, yeah, I don't, it, it's, I went through that same learning process with pencil and paper at some point and I just don't remember it. So it's, it's just kind of like, the only difference is that now I remember that painful process. I, I do yeah, there's definitely, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it wasn't anything important. I said that the one thing I do remember about drawing is really struggling with the number two. When people do that, like curly two that has the little curl and goes into the tail, I really struggled with that for the longest time. <laughs> and I remember drawing like a whole thing with like dinosaurs in this swampy landscape and said, I shall never draw again for I cannot draw two. <laughs> yeah. I was a dramatic child. But <laughs> All right. Has everybody typed up their stuff? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so let's see. Anthony's, where did it go? Uh, the scene um, under the second period at the bottom. Okay. All right. Excellent. You want to read that off? Um, question being, how does uh, Gladys interrogate uh, Elroy? It was like Gladys finds Elroy restrained on a rack in a leather gimp suit. She begins ripping the stitches of his other gimp suits, torturing <laughs> him until he caves to tell her where Frida is going. Gladys leaves Elroy in a shameful knit gimp suit. And this is how uh, Gladys <laughs> finds out where Frida's going after leaving Elroy embarrassed. All right. Uh, it's even funnier because those actually exist. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and Napoleon, where's, yes. where did yours end up? I've lost track. Uh, let's see. And then mine is, uh, should be under, I just wrote it. Where is it? <laughs> Under, uh, under fourth period, Frida and the Sim follow the path of knitted trinkets. Should be under there. Why does Gladys pursue the needle kit? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The last uh, second to last column, very bottom. Yeah. Why does Gladys pursue the needle kit and the semen? A musical number reveals where Gladys. Uh, I'm sorry. A musical number where Gladys reveals how she is just a victim of her addiction. She wanted much more from this provincial life, and quilting and semen offered her an escape. All right. Doesn't we'll it to all of us? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. So looking... you're going to be singing Gladys, Chris. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at the time. I'm going to go ahead and pass on being the focus if As wants to take a turn. Okay. Okay. So um, what do you want to focus I will... on? I would like to focus on... Um... The love between Brother Amir and Frida, because I also love Brother Amir. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and write that up. So you get to add um, either our period in a nested event or an event in a nested scene. Okay, uh, well, I certainly want Brother Amir to discover uh, Sim and Frida 
in their uh, torture bind in the uh, cave of the penis-like spider. So, I think that would be another period where um, Brother Amir rescues Frida and Sim uh, from the cave. All right. And this spell. All right. All right. The love between Brother Amir and Frida. And I'll let you go ahead and type. <clears throat> Don, right. have you um, added uh, any voices uh, to um, Creeping Wave yet? I know you just did your interview. No, on, no, that's uh, been it so far. I contributed a poem to the upcoming Burroughs uh, mm -hmm. collection. Uh, yes. I'd be willing to contribute. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I got I got a nice mic. <laughs> yeah, if anybody here would like to do voices, I can try to work you in. Um, so yeah, it's um, I. It I'm I'm still in the process of writing the new season right now because converting it over from my storyline to. And then of course there's changes and stuff like that, but we're, we're slowly divulging bit by bit uh, at the opening of uh, every you mind with the animation. We're keeping the plot line going. Uh, Cause previously it's been just like, okay, well this amount of time has passed since we were with our characters. And so now we're trying to keep it in the public consciousness. I get a lot of criticism. People are like, oh, you do two podcasts. And it's like, yeah. I, I'd like people to know that I do two podcasts <laughs> instead of it being a surprise four years later. <laughs> I do, like, I do uh, like when people argue with me about that. <laughs> They're just like, you weren't doing the podcast back then. And I'm just like, oh, I was. Yeah, 2016. <laughs> yeah. um, so speaking of voices, here's a short anecdote. So I, I run two tabletop role playing games, uh, Blades in the Dark and Monster of the Week. And mm -hmm. I just experimented with voice changing software for that. Ooh. Ooh. So the Monster of the Week game was a crop circle that was actually a Minotaur's uh, maze. And oh, when right. the Minotaur <laughs> entered, I put the voice effect on and the Minotaur had, you know, this big villain speech. And when I was done, everyone said, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> so distorted, <laughs> nobody could understand what I was, what I was going on about. Um, I think there's potential there with the, these voice changing software, but God, the, the software all sounds a little weird. And I it's don't know real I want... distorted. Yeah, um, I don't know if I want to. You know, like the woman filter doesn't really sound like a woman. <laughs> no, um, but neither do I. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you know, there's a, a selection of things that are just effects that they labeled as robot and elf and dwarf or whatever. Um, yeah. So still, and also it's like, God, they're kind of expensive. Forty dollars for just something that changes your voice a little bit. I, I've been thinking about it um, since everything is, you know, online now. I've been playing on Roll Twenty for a while, and the the idea of like the voice changers have, have kind of crossed my mind because for your general NPCs and players, like most people just kind of pitch up or down a little bit, like mm -hmm. a dialect or accent of some kind. But like if you want to get into like a weird ass monster, like you want to go a little farther. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize they were that expensive and still not <laughs> super great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, not gaming, but one of those YouTube channels I watch where the guy uh, fucks with scammers. So mm -hmm. he'll has a n number of effects on there, and he's his is really good. Like he'll play an old woman or play an old man or whatever, or play a teenage girl. But I looked it up. He's got like a two hundred fifty dollar piece of equipment there that he doesn't. Oh, with. Like, that's, that's what it takes. Yeah. That's like even more for. <laughs> Yeah, that's not YouTube money. We're making podcasts over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Az, did you finish typing? Yeah, I just okay. started the period. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. All right, excellent. Let me flip over the board. Go ahead and read that off. Brother Amir rescues Frida and Sim from the lair of the giant penis leg mm -hmm. spider. Q. All right. All right, and boom, boom. Anthony. Your turn. Uh, and the focus is the love between Brother Amir and Frida. So you are now writing Lord of the Rings slash through a filter of William S. Burroughs. Yes! 
hot. Sorry, that got me really excited. <laughs> As well it should. Uh, cool. I can kind of adapt uh, a scene I was thinking about earlier for this um, because I was looking at uh, the palette and some of the things that we hadn't really touched on yet. Uh, so I want to make the uh, event of uh, Brother Amir's uh, kind of heroic entrance into the cave of Harab um, and fighting off Harab with, I can only rem really imagine as a um, flamingo-esque sword a la uh, Alice in Wonderland from Disney. <laughs> uh beating back uh, Harab, uh, who retreats back into the caves, uh, and then using uh, the, uh, the the beak to cut through the webs, uh, freeing uh, both, uh, was it Simon? Uh, I think it's just Simon. Simon Frida that, that are in there together? Frida and Sim. Mm -hmm. Frida and Sim. Uh, and this heroic act uh, kind of sparks the love between uh, the three of them. <laughs> oh, the three of them, nice. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm yeah. Here. <laughs> well, I appreciate your restraint of not including the penis spider as well. <laughs> I mean, you know, three's company, four is a crowd. Were there any besides Naked Lunch? Were there any other Burroughs inspired m movies? movies or... I don't think so, it, unless you count uh, Wild Boys, the French film. But it, mm -hmm. it's very loosely mm -hmm. like, yeah. Um, there was the Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy did the album, which was basically just his spoken word accompanied by music. I think that's really his delivery is so uniquely him. Mm -hmm. That that works out nicely. Although I really I, like I, that album. I yeah. remember hearing that uh, in the early days of the beat movement, they tried to pair up jazz for mm -hmm. performances, and yeah. it was it didn't get along right because the, the beats were just like, "Won't you stop playing so people can hear me?" And the jazz musicians are like, "Well, won't you shut up so we can keep playing?" Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, oh, uh, so yeah, we're watching um, and speaking. Of, Going back to the subject of role-playing games, um, rewatching Naked Lunch, it occurred to me that the role-playing game on the edge, or is heavily influenced by all that interzone stuff. It's about um, the setting is is this uh, island off the coast of Africa, and then the the queen of that nation decided uh, after World War II to reinvent her culture based on America. So it's mm -hmm. got this weird blending of of African uh, and American cultures going on too, and a bunch of weird stuff happens there too. There's, you know, symbiotic aliens and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. Again, something I should have picked up a long, long time ago. But the, the <laughs> aliens are actually called mugwumps. Right, and, uh, mugwumps. Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> and then, in addition to inter, well, first of all, like interzone is a weird name for a place in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. Something. It sounds such a sci-fi name, but then it's also um, medieval in its setting and, and values and stuff. Um, yeah. And then there's another, at the end of it, I realized there's another location. What was it called? Like Adjunxia or something like that? Oh, yeah. Adjun yeah. Um, the, the Russia. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. All right. I got my event up there. All right. Let's go back and read it. Flip Brother over. Amir enters the cave heroically to save Frida and Sim, fighting off the penis leg spider Harab with a flamingo sword. Harab retreats back into their cave, and both Frida and Sim are enthralled by Brother Amir's heroics. Nice. All right. Napoleon, would you like mm -hmm. to expand on the love between Brother Amir and Frida? Yes. Um, I think that uh, the eagles were flying overhead. Uh, and they saw Brother Amir and the friends, and they were just like, we got to get in on that. So <laughs> they swooped down, and they're like, Anyone you know, we right? can, yeah, you, you guys want to go to that bat of elvish semen? I mean, it's on I the heard way. you needed a ride. <laughs> so. Maybe you look at like how 
we're, we're addressing the, the big pishnickety thing about Lord of the Rings is that the elves actually are going to, <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, eagles are actually going to deliver eagles, them to the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, conceptually, we've a... got maybe 30 minutes to an hour out of uh, the, the setting, the beginning setting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the next 30 minutes is just a graphic. <laughs> yeah. So, it, would that be an event? Uh, yeah, let, you know, let's make that an event underneath there. Okay. All right. So add an event. And we're closing in at two hours, so I think we're just going to wrap it up here. Okay. Okay. This is a beautiful story, guys. It is. <laughs> What I love about this game is it never ends. It almost never ends up being what you think it's going to be at the beginning. Not even close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the exception is if your high concept is hard sci-fi, it always ends up being the expanse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when Napoleon's finished typing up, we're going to take turns reading down the columns. This is a summary. All right. All right. I'll go ahead and, and yeah. read that one off, Napoleon. Okay. So the Eagles want in on Brother Amir, Frida, and Sim's love, so they offer mm -hmm. them a ride to the scene of that. All right. And once you continue, go ahead and, and read down that first column with, with Billy the Riddle. Okay. So the first column with Billy the Riddle. Oh, let me scroll over there. Hold on. So, okay. Billy the Riddle hands down his needle kit to his niece, Frida. Silverback Jerry, shaman of the gray sky, comes to Frida and tries to convince her to drop her habit. What happened to Jerry and Frida? Silverback Jerry confesses feelings for Frida, but, condo but condones their sex and drug lifestyle, asks Frida to give up the life, but Frida denies them and leaves Jerry, sullen in a downpour of rain. Frida goes on for the next fix of Elfcombe, and Jerry is met by a new romantic partner, the gardener, Sim. They tragically broke up. All right, I'll take the so. next call. Frida meets the fellowship in a drug-fueled orgy. Romancing Elroy is the linchpin for the elvish involvement. Princess of the Elves is shamed and shunned for having physical sex with humans. Gladys, on the trail of the needle kit, captures and interrogates Elroy, binding him in yarn and leaving him to be discovered by the other elves to his shame. How does Gladys inter interrogate Elroy? Gladys finds Elroy restrained in a rack in a leather gimp suit. She begins ripping the stitches out of his other gimp suits, torturing him until he caves to tell her where Frida is going. Gladys, bleh, Gladys leaves Elroy in a shameful knit gimp suit. Gladys finds out where Elroy is going after leaving Elroy embarrassed. Uh, AZ, go on. Next one. A broken-hearted silverback Jerry visits another shaman, White Streak Saul, for advice. But Saul traps Jerry in his Victorian mansion. White Streak Saul is a drug lord who controls the elf semen trade and has sexually hypnotized the strong leader of the roaming plains tribes. White Streak Saul, threatened by Frida's discovery of the elf cum fats and the source of Saul's control, sends Brother Amir to stop Frida, but instead falls in love, watching her from afar. Gladys, the robe quilter, used to be a drug runner for White Streak Saul, but broke away from Saul's sexual hypnosis to seek the ancient bat of elfish semen on her own. All right, Anthony, why don't you take the next call? Frida and Sim follow the path of knitted trinkets. Frida and Sim discover Gladys. Where does Gladys take them? Gladys leads them to the den of Harab, the giant human spider with penises for legs, who spins the yarn that Gladys uses to make her quilts. Rob uses this yarn to bind and to bind Frida and Sim into a BDSM style imprisonment, leaving the trail open for Gladys to find the elvish vat of semen without impediment from Frida or Sim. Why does Gladys pursue the needle kit and the semen? A musical number where Gladys reveals how or how she is just a victim of her addiction. She wanted much more from this provincial life and quilting and semen offered her an escape. All right, Napoleon, penultimate column, please. Mm. Oh, are we waiting on me? Yeah, second to last column. I think tone froze. Oh, okay. 
You real jittery. Is that better? That's a good screenshot right there. <laughs> go <ahead. laughs> Please go ahead and read. You back? Are you with us? Uh, this is terrible. You're Almost. with us. Give us a sign. Give us the finger guns again. Blink if, if you need help. <laughs> <laughs> I had to send a text message. Please keep reading. Nope. Oh, I heard you. Almost. Oh, am I back? Oh. Hey. Almost. Oh, please keep reading. Okay. Uh, okay, keep reading. Okay, yeah. so I will take the next. So, Brother Mir rescues Frida and Sam from the giant, the lair of the giant penis lake spider. Brother Mir enters the cave heroically to save Frida and Sam, fighting off the penis lake spider Harab with a flamingo sword. Harab retreats back into the cave, and both Frida and Sam are enthralled by Brother Amir's heroics. Eagles want in on Brother Amir, Frida, and Sam's love. So they offer them a ride to the scene of that. And then who shall take the next? As you want I to take it. take it. Yeah. <laughs> Frida throws her needle kit into the ancient vat of semen, elfish vat of semen. Gladys, the rogue quilter, leads Frida to the vat of elf semen, hoping to reclaim the needlepoint kit she once possessed. All right, can people hear me yet? What was that? All right, uh, so I've lost contact with everybody else, but I'm just going to go ahead and read off the end of it. Uh, okay. Oh, you hear, so people are hearing me. Now yeah. I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. You're back. A little awkward moment there. I'm glad it, it waited this long to, to fail on us. But. <laughs> <laughs> True. So thanks to everybody. Thanks to my guests for joining me in this experiment. William S. Burroughs, Lord of the Rings. Uh, Thanks to the people who created the games and the board. Uh, thanks all of you audience members. And this is where you can, if you, well, let me ask you this. How do you think a, a YouTube channel like this supports itself? Do you think we do some sort of horrible ad read for Squarespace or maybe like sure. a Patreon with no followers? No. Only fans account. <laughs> <laughs> if you liked what we did here, you can support us by following our podcast or buying our books or buying our comic, right? Uh, Lord, League of Ridiculous Conversations, Creeping Wave Radio, I Don't Want to Be Famous, and then for me, it's The Faith Machine and Picking Up the Ghost. This was released under Creative Commons, share like attribution. You can go ahead and build anything you want on this for commercial use if you like. Uh, you just credit back to us. Uh, and... Send it back to us so we can see what you made. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. We yeah, want please this to live on. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Also, that, I'll caveat that. You have to tell us what you did, too, because we want to know. Uh, all right. Oh, if, yeah. If you are a creative professional and you'd like to be in an episode, please let me know in the comments. If you have other themes that you want to see touched on, please let me know in the comments. Uh, any last thoughts, anybody? I think I've lost everybody again because nobody's saying anything. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Now <laughs> we hear you. Okay. We didn't hear the subject of the sentence. Oh, okay. Uh, Anything anyone want to say wrapping up? Uh, thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. This has been a lot of fun. Right. I've discovered a lot about uh, William S. Burroughs. <laughs> Long live the penis legged spider. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. On live the penis legged spider. Justice for Harab. Right. Justice for Harab. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And that's that.